I grew up in uh, Western Sydney, so from a young age, mum would go shopping in Cabramatta for meat and do her vegetables something else. So it was very multicultural. Um, and I think that's where I've got, you know, that you know, drive to kind of step into where I am in terms of a chef. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Starting your very own restaurant is an exciting, challenging, exhausting, and exhilarating experience. Many in the industry dream of the day they can call a restaurant their own. Having found the location and devised an offering for the local market, you dig your heels in for the first year of trade. But what if the landscape changes? The pandemic forced state governments to close their borders. What if the restaurants on the border of states whose borders are shut, meaning the locals once relied on, have no means to get to your door? Alex Munoz is the co-owner and chef of Labatt Restaurant in Burley Heads, Queensland. Alex, how are you going? I'm very well, Anthony. How are you? Good, mate. Thanks for joining us. You're only 15 minutes from the New South Wales border, and I'm guessing a lot of your clientele come from New South Wales. Um, what's this period of time been like with the borders shut? Yeah, look, um, t- t- to be honest, I mean, we're like, like you said, we're only that, that 15 minute drive uh, just over the Tweed. Um, but the, the impact for us really, um, you know, it, it always could be better, I guess, if if those um, Byron Bay diners can come up and, and experience the Gold Coast. But um, um, yeah, we, we've seen a massive change, especially starting of winter. Um, I think once everybody was um, confined into, you know, just surrounding themselves in, in Queensland, um, we, we, we've seen some some real heavy, you know, people come through in terms of, you know, Brisbane diners and, and people coming from Noosa making their way down. So, you know, generally I think those people t- uh, tend to go in the state or, or maybe or, or bypass Burley Heads and, and head to Byron. But um, you know, you know, this winter has just been in- incredible, and I think the support that people have been showing um, has been amazing. And um, yeah, I yeah, it, it really, I you know, it's always good to, ha- to possibly get those people to come over. Um, and I think they've just announced yesterday that it has, it is going to open up, which is fantastic news. Um, not just for us, just you know, dynamically for for the whole state, um, just to generate a little bit of. Um, you know, people coming through, I think it will, it will be a massive boost. Um, yeah, definitely. Has this period of time since you reopened the restaurant to having diners inside, has that surprised you, the response that you got from the Queensland public? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we, we've changed a lot about our, our business model from, from, from takeaway to where we are now. Um, but the, the, the scene in, in Queensland is, is massively changing rapidly and um, people are very supportive um, in terms of, especially what we're doing here on the coast. And you know, even though we are in we are in a, a, you know a smaller city in terms of the Gold Coast, it's still still quite um, you know quite small. And and you know, it's really affected by that 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 trade in, in the summer trade. You know, having people coming coming up for holidays. Um, but the response has been awesome. You know, there's there's still that that one meter rule that affects us massively in our small restaurant because, you know, we've, we've gone from being a 60 seater to, you know, a 28 to max 30 if we can, depending on the night, but um, it's, it's massively restricted, but you know, there's a good handful of people that um, are, are really taking this, 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 this pandemic very serious. And then there's another handful of people that just going about their business. So it's a happy medium to kind of keep everybody happy and, and, you know, just respect, you know, those people that are coming in here and aware of, you know, is there sanitation and, you know, we're going through the right process of, you know, keeping them safe. And, you know, for, for us, that's that's super important from day one. You mentioned earlier that the restaurants changed quite a bit since that time that you were doing takeaway, but you moved really quickly into takeaway um, within a matter of days. Can you take us through that process of when the industry got shut down and, and how you were feeling and what response you did? Yeah, definitely. From I think from the um, I think it was about a week and a half before our our first fourth um, shutdown. That um, yeah, me, me and Carla, we just um, my brother-in-law lives in San Francisco, and we it, it only took us to see what was happening around the world for us to make that decision. 
And a lot of people may have thought that we were crazy because we decided on the Sunday lunch, we had finished lunch and we just do lunch on Sundays and we said, you know what, this is not, this is going to get out of hand very quickly and we need to react like super fast. So what's the quickest way for us to change our business model um, to take away? So by, by the following Wednesday, we all came back to work and um, yeah, it was, you know, rustic food and comfort food at, at an affordable price as well, because we kind of thought to ourselves, well, if this pandemic's really going to affect the economy, are people going to have enough money to be spending on our normal menus? And also, do we want to tarnish our reputation in such a small period of time? You know, at the time we were about a year and a half, oh, coming up to two years, sorry, into our business. And we kind of thought, what's the best way to, to kind of keep us at the same level where we are, where one day if we were to come back to normality, um, that we can continue, you know, where we, where we, where we left off. And for us, um, you know, having the Queensland um, diners, it was super important that, you know, our demographic as well, it's a lot of that older clientele that's retired and, you know, do they want to be coming out to the restaurant and, you know, what's the best way that we can get them food and, you know, do they want to be paying a premium and, you know, you know, all, all this came into play and, um, yeah, for us, it, it just became a no-brainer. Uh, first and foremost was our, our staff and how can we retain them. Obviously, the casuals were affected massively um, and then the government stepped in and, and, and helped them out, which was which was well, is still awesome. But um, for us, our full kitchen team are all full-timers. So, um, you know, a lot of them have um, are married and, and have kids and that. So, you know, for us, it was super important, not only for myself, but for them to, to say, hang on here, you know, we actually have to come back to normality one day and we need a team. And if we start losing all these international chefs, you know, that is especially like you look at Sydney, Melbourne, it's like, you know, they've had to just pack up and go home. So to try to reboot your business into finding staff, for us, it was like, you know, we need to keep these guys going um, and have something to come back to. So the front of staff, I think you can always find people here and there. But in terms of a good quality kitchen team, um, for Carla and I, it was just super important that we just hang on to these guys and do the best we can to just, A, keep them motivated, um, keep them busy, and not just sit at home and, and just look at this pandemic, you know, constantly on TV. So that was a real, a real um, positive for us in terms of moving forward and just keeping everything as normal. Your food is certainly not um, takeaway kind of food ordinarily in the restaurant. So what sort of food did you do in in such a short amount of time and switch to to suit a takeaway model? Yeah, we look we, we tried a few different things and uh, our, our kitchen is definitely not designed for the masses, um, <laughs> which, you know, when you're trying to do a, a cock of van <laughs> with a reduced red wine sauce for over 100 people um, and it's not coming out the way you want it, it's just... It's just very frustrating, and when when you know when when chefs are so pedantic and kind of you need it to be perfect, it just eats you away. Um, but we're doing things like lasagnas and you know different stews. I think I've brought out some stews from my heritage, from my background. You know, mum was giving me some recipes. Mum was doing some chili and cakes, you know, and, and kind of just putting that out there, and she was helping out as wow. well. So yeah, which was really cool, and and people were actually like responding extremely well once once that once the first force lockdown happened everybody kind of was you know knocking at the door sending emails saying you guys were ahead and you know we had other industry people call us and say you know how did you attack this and um you know it, it was it was a challenge but um i think that comfort food and um, the price point that we put it at was it's so accessible for so many people that we had to cap it. We had to cap our numbers because we're only X amount of chefs in the kitchen. And we're like, we just can't do 300. You know, we can only do X amount. And, um, yeah, you know, but it, it, it's good fun cooking rustic food. It was almost like cooking staff meal every day. But, you know, put it into takeaway containers and trying to get it out there, which was, uh, it's good. It, it, it kind of, it boosted it boosted the kitchen a little bit and everybody had their go and, um, you know, try different things and, you know, we all worked things out together and, and, and came, came, came to an end result and just kind of went, right, what do we go from here? Oh, okay, let's start packaging. And then, um, yeah, it just, it really took off at first. And um, I think once everybody started to reopen slowly in Queensland, it kind of just died out, but there are still a, a good handful of people that still want it. You know, there's, 
still people out there are pretty concerned with the situation that we're in and don't really want to come out to restaurants and that's that's totally understandable you know it's that that older dem- demographic that I was talking about that are a bit concerned of what's going on you made a name for yourself uh, with the Bentley group uh, but then you ventured off to do your own thing uh, what led you to Burley Heads uh, well it was actually um, it was when, when I was working at monopole um, I met my wife Carla through um, she was working at the time for crew media uh, the PR agency she was actually doing a PR for Monopole and, um, you know, we're living about 100 metres from each other on McClay Street and Potts Point and, um, yeah, once once we got together, that relationship obviously built and um, I've actually lived and worked on the coast um, from when I was about a first year apprentice and I did that for two years and then I worked in a French bistro and it really, you know, really that was the best restaurant at the time and I'm talking back then when you probably couldn't get a decent coffee <laughs> around the coast and there wasn't really much. So, um, yeah, for us, you know, obviously having Carla's background in PR and myself as a chef, you know, you know, we, we love to, 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 to travel and eat. And, and for us, it was a no brainer, uh, earning our own restaurant was, you know, we kind of just looked at each other and said, we need to do this for ourselves one day. And, um, yeah, Carla, Carla lived on the coast and went to school here. So she's got a whole bunch of friends. Um, but we, 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 every time we, we came up, we, we saw a, um, a gap in the market for just a, a really good solid restaurant and it didn't really have to be at a high level. Um, and I think, yeah, there was just a good, good handful of people that we knew that were traveling to Melbourne or traveling to Brisbane and, and nothing really on the coast. And I think Burley is one of those locations where it's a little hub in itself and um, it was just, it was just, I think, I think to us at the time, it was just, you know, asking for something that was half decent and, um, and there are, there are a good handful of restaurants in Burley, but um, I think our, what we offer was, um, yeah, it's quite, it's quite unique and it was different. It's a little bit different. It, some people put, uh, put it as a, you know, a, a typical Sydney restaurant, but um, yeah, I mean, for us, it was uh, a whole, whole bunch of things that kind of led us to here and, um, you know, having that sea change was super important. But, um, yeah, we kind of, from the minute we met uh, in, in Monopole, we kind of uh, said to ourselves, yeah, we need, we need a change and something needs to happen. But, um, yeah, we, we, looked at, we looked at this option and we looked at Sydney as well. And um, for us, it was just a bigger picture and uh, we, where we saw ourselves in about, you know, the 10-year plan. And we just uh, we dove straight into it and just said, you know, Burley's, Burley's the mark and, we, we just got to go for it. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about your food? What, what is your style of, of cooking? And we're, we're, it's springtime now. What, what sort of food is on the menu? Uh, at the moment, um, you know, a lot of citrus at the moment. Um, we, it's funny you ask that question. A lot of people approach us at the door and say, what kind of a cuisine are you? And it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what we are. I mean, we always say modern, modern Australian, but then people are like modern Australian. What, what's that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> expecting that we're going to have wallaby and kangaroo and and just some real wacky stuff. But you know, we we always um we keep things super simple here at Labar. You know, we're um we're very seasonal. Um, you know, currently we have asparagus has just popped in. Um, we've got loads of citrus, broad beans, um, bolotti beans. I think are just on the way out. You know, collet. So. We're really trying to work with simple ingredients um, and, and just make delicious food. You know, when we first started off, we were a la carte only and we we're doing, um, I think our first, um, our first approach was definitely that share style, kind of, kind of what, I guess, what Monopole was and just interesting flavors with interesting techniques. Um, but it's, it slowly pro- has progressed to where we are now from our, you know, a seven course, um, seven course menu. Um, but it's still, it's still, we're still very true to what we do in terms of simplicity. Um, you know, our, our cooking here at Labard is very technical driven. Um, but our presentation and, and what, what we, what we put on the plate is very approachable to the customer. Um, you know, which for me, I think it's super important because, um, you know, we, we, we kind of have this thing at the bar where we say, you know, the customers always come first and then the wine and food come after. So we don't really have that expectation of people coming here and saying, we're just here for the food and the chef. You know, for us, it's a it's an overall experience, what we're trying to deliver. Um, 
And uh, yeah, at the end of the day, I always say to my staff in brief, you know, without any customers, there's no restaurant. So um, it's super important that not only do they get a good feed and, and drink awesome wine, that the, the delivery of our service has to be on point as well. And people just have to come here and have a good time and, and feel like, you know, they've had a good experience, which is which is what we do. Um, but the food remains, like I said, extremely simple, uh, very seasonal and um, yeah, food that people can relate to and still have that little tweak of interesting in it. You mentioned that you did your apprenticeship on the coast. What led you to a career as a chef? Um, at the time, um, at the time I was, I was in Sydney and I was, I was doing a whole, whole bunch of jobs really here and there and just trying to trying to um, figure out what I wanted to do with my life. But um, it was my oldest brother um, is a chef. And at the time he, he approached me and I was living at, I was living by myself um, in, in Petersham at the time. And I always just enjoyed having people over and um, coming from that South American background, we would always have, um, you know, family get togethers on the weekend and things like that were really important to us. And, you know, f- seafood is a massive thing in the family and a lot of uh, Chilean barbecues or asados is like a, a weekly tradition and loads of meat. Um, so, you know, th- th- those, um, you know, those kind of memories for me is always embedded in my head. And, you know, I grew up in uh, Western Sydney. So from a young age, mum would go shopping in Cabramatta for meat and do her vegetables something else. So it was very multicultural. Um, and I think that's where I've got, you know, that, 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 you know, drive to kind of step into where I am in terms of a chef. I think it was that, that family kind of, um, you know, what I grew up with and, um, what my parents have, you know, taught me as a, as a kid and how to eat, um, has kind of led me to be where I am now. But initially it was my brother. He kind of just said, he's like, you know, start cooking. You love the lifestyle. It's good party life. And (laughs) <laughs> uh, probably not the best advice, but he's like, you know, it's it, it's good morale. You work in a team. He goes, I reckon you thrive in it. And um, my first job was at the art gallery in New South Wales at the restaurant. Oh, wow. That was where I first kicked off. Yeah, I, and, and now it's completely changed. But I remember just stepping into there and, you know, I walked in with my buttons, my chef buttons the wrong way and my jacket was inside out and, and and uh, just basic stuff like making mayonnaise and I, and I would completely stuff that up. But um, I did um, the functions at night, night time and that just was a serious buzz for me. And kind of when someone gives you a task and you have to complete it, it's just like you kind of – it's overwhelming. You know, everybody's just running around and kind of trying to get their head around things. And, yeah, it instantly just clicked with me and I thought to myself, okay, I'm – really going to start taking this serious and then um yeah and then I had two family members that moved up to Queensland about about 20 years ago um and we're a tight-knit family so I just moved up but my brother said there's a really good French bistro uh called French uh the uh, Champagne Brasserie that you need to get your hands on and try to get in there and it was a really good starting point for me um, because it was the basics you know um Cocovan and beef bourguignon and confit dark and riettes and pâtés and it was the real base of cooking and I think that's that shows in my cooking now and it's funny that we've come back to Burley and here I am open up what people describe it as a Parisian style um, slash New York restaurant <laughs> in the middle of Burley so people come in here and they're like we don't even feel like we're in Burley anymore and you know our restaurant overlooks a car park which is horrendous but <laughs> once you're in here it kind of transports you somewhere else and I think that's pretty cool because um um you know we I still have the you know that that drive of as a as an apprentice working at that French bistro um which has then replicated into my cooking now and I think it's just super important um to have you know a good base of whatever cuisine it is um you know, for me, on a, on a personal level, it's it's great to mentor the chefs that come through here to get their bases down pat because, you know, a lot of my chefs have either worked in hotels or resorts. So uh, to put them in this environment, for me to give them the tools to actually go, right, this is how you probably have to do things, um, it's, it's massively rewarding. And um, I think there needs to be a little bit more of that in order to keep our industry going because... You know, this is just a stepping stone for them to come in here and then go, right, I want to move to Melbourne. Yeah, sure, go work here. You know, this is a great place to work and you can better yourself. So, um, yeah, I, I really tell my chefs that 
this is kind of a location to use as a stepping stone and get your basics down and, and just become a solid cook. And then from there, you can kind of grow. Um, but yeah, that, that was, a, that was a, the start of my cooking. And then I think after that, I went back to Sydney and kind of just in my head said, right, I need to start putting myself in like the best restaurants I can. I think at the time, uh, Mark just got the free hats and um, I happened to walk in and um, just randomly, <laughs> I was like, I spoke to Pasi and I was like, can I have a job? And he's like, come back tomorrow, you know, with that, the Finnish accent. And he's like, come back tomorrow. And then, um, yeah, he's like, come back tomorrow. He's like, okay, we'll give you a go. But um, I got the job somehow. And um, for me, after that, everything changed. My whole, my whole uh, philosophy and, and, and my thoughts on cooking went, went to a different level. And I was just, in, you know, absolutely buzzing. And um, I think that that was a big impact in my life. Um, and I learned, um, I learned some serious cooking there and, uh, it's probably one of the hardest kitchens I've worked in, um, that and, and the Bentley, but, um, yeah, it, it was so cool. And yeah, I think if it wasn't for my brother trying to just nudge me and say, you know, go, go do an apprenticeship, which was incredibly hard back then. I think I was earning about 180 bucks a week and living, trying to live in Petersham by myself and. At, I, you know, at one point I was like, I can't afford this. I had to go out west, and then trying to get out west. Once you miss your twelve o'clock, you know, train to Stratfield, it's like free buses after that. So I would get home at like four in the morning, sleep for like until seven, and then get another another train back. And it's like a constant battle for a year. It's just like oh, I miss my train, and you know, back then. The metro, or the, the, I think the closest was Parramatta to get you out there, and now it's a bit more. Um, I, I think they've uh, pulled their finger out, and it's it's more accessible. But back then, it wasn't. I think my, I mean, a couple of times I had to call my dad, and my dad, there's no buses. Can you come and get me in Stratfield? And dad's like, "What are you talking about? You know, like I've got to get up at six o'clock to go to work." <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I can easily say that it, it's paid off, and a lot of hard hard work. But um, yeah, it's it's been pretty cool. Your brother got you started or interested in the industry, but your family always had these feasts and gatherings, as you mentioned, and you grew up with your mum's cooking. What what dishes stand out from those days? Oh, um, uh, yeah, I think winter winter in Chile is um, is a real big thing um, for us. We use a lot of chickpeas and a lot of pork and um, a lot of lentils, but. Um, my mum makes this uh, soup called. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a real big soup person, and it's it's quite sad because Carla's not a soup person. So every time I'm like, let's go out for a, you know a ramen, she's like, oh, I'll I'll just get a gyoza. I'm like, oh, that's not cool, is it? <laughs> 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 but um, my mum makes um this beef like a beef beef brisket stew, and you know it's 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 very much just super basic, just you know overcooked beef in into a stock with heaps of vegetables and. It's, it's, it's this Chilean uh, hot sauce that they use called Belde, um, which is, you know, put a dollop of that in it and it's just like starts to, starts to sing in your mouth. And that's, that's things that I definitely grew up with, with mum. You know, mum makes empanadas from scratch and, you know, wood fire, wood fired empanadas. Yeah. And, you know, these are all flavors that I knew from a young age, you know, even, even going to, um, Cabramatta at, at like the age of five, like we'll just go eat and eat a bowl of a rice or, or whatever and just stop and eat. And then it's just exposed to so much back then. And it's, it's really, that was really cool. But, um, yeah, mum has some awesome dishes. She's got this other one called, uh, lenteja, which is like a lentil stew with, uh, shaved parmesan, which is probably not, not chilling at all with the, the parmesan element, but uh, it's got this like real banging pork chop on top of it. Um, and the stew's just cooked out in, in the pork stock, which is uh, extremely comforting. Um, and then you have your, like, your street foods, obviously. Like, you, uh, there's this Chilean hot dog that's, um, you know, uh, called the, the completo. It's kind of like avocado, sauerkraut. And I think it's that German influence that has arrived to Chile that has got that sauerkraut in there. But, um, yeah, our, our weekends as a family were spent, you know, on, over charcoal and, and cooking cooking loads of meat, which is, you know, by the end of it, you've got your meat sweats and potato salad and cabbage salad. And, um, yeah, just, just I think just your basics. And that was very, um, you know, very comforting. And 
you know, we, we don't see each other as, as much as we do back then than we do now, but um, we definitely, uh, you know, when we get together, we uh, love cooking up a feast, so that's pretty cool. Do the food influences from those days sneak onto the menus that you create now in the restaurant at all? Uh, yeah, no, 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 I've had a lot of I've had a lot of um, South American friends ask me if I'm, you know, some dishes kind of give them a bit of memory, um, some sense of memory in terms of their childhood that come into the restaurant. And there are a few elements that I put together in terms of sauces and and dishes to, dishes that kind of are, are not, but we, we we try to make that flavor combination come through. Um, mum was making this cake um, through the lockdown well, when we were doing takeaway. So it's like crispy layer biscuits with, um, you know, caramelised dulce leche and then shredded coconut. And you kind of rep- repeat the process and it's um, it's called a thousand layers, but um, um, it's, it's so sweet. Like you, you have a slice and you just, you know, unless you don't have a sweet tooth, like, like I don't, um, it's just so sweet, but it, it's extremely delicious. And that's made it onto the menu and has become something that um, has been extremely simple. And it's it's actually just an anglaise of dulce leche and coconut sorbet. And um, I think my mum came in with my brother and um, they sat down and had a meal. And I didn't tell them about it until they got to the end. I was just watching them take that first spoon in their mouth. And I think mum even started crying. She's, she's like, how, does, how did you get this to taste like the cake? And I was like, that was a, that was a pretty pretty um, cool moment because, um, you know, to have, to have your mum in, in, in your restaurant that you work so hard for, um, you know, share, share a tear over, over something so simple was um was was really nice to see and um it's still i think we're just making we're actually making changes to get it off now but um that was something that was uh pretty special and um yeah there are little things like that that we do put on the menu that you know it's 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 stuck it's 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 embedded in me and why not if it's delicious then put it on Mm. you brought a new level of dining to the area and then you had to change to takeaway and then you've changed back to a restaurant Will what you offer change moving forward as a result of this pandemic? Um, not necessarily. Um, I think we're we're extremely comfortable um, where 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 we are at at the moment with the restaurant. Um, yes, we have eliminated some tables, and obviously, um, the dynamic of having more people in our space is you know it's not the great business model when you lose half your seating. But um, you know, we went from doing a la carte to trying to do two seatings, two and a half seatings for a summer to doing one seating now. And, and pe- people are, are really jumping on board the fact that we're giving them a little bit more attention. So the set menu has offered us, um, has really has really given the diner a, a, a better experience. And it's just given us um, a bit more of a direction in terms of what we're offering for people. Um, and I think that's, that's, it really shows. And it's quite important because, um, you know, our staff, you know, have a better lifestyle and, you know, at the moment we're only operating Friday, Saturday, Sunday and Sunday is just the lunch. So we're really trying to compact everybody into this smaller dining space uh, and dining time during the, during the end of the weekend where it's really been beneficial for everyone. Um, you know, the staff are getting their appropriate hours and the chefs get to spend more time at home with their wives and their kids and, you know, Carla and I can concentrate on on our personal life and you know possibly look at the next thing and it's just it's just a real eye opener that you know why why were we working so hard and I think that's part of the reason why we moved up to the coast it was, it was to get away from that you know that real grind of trying to do long hours and not have that work life balance um, but now the restriction with the restaurant it's like the 1.5 meter in between tables has has kind of looking around and and you know everybody's you know, chilled out and, and really enjoying their time without having to be kicked out for that next dining. And people have looked at Labatt as, as a more experienced kind of, um, you know, celebration kind of restaurant. So we kind of uh, have taken that on board and said, okay, maybe we don't have to go back to doing 80 covers on, you know, on the weekend and kind of just really just, um, you know, just charge a little bit more and, and make it more of a, an experience for people to, to eat at Labatt, but um, I think it's really worked in our favour. So I don't, I don't think from from where we are now. Once hopefully things get back to normal, um, I definitely feel that we'll probably keep our same structure. Mm. At the top of the show, we talked briefly about 
the borders reopening between New South Wales and Queensland, how important will that be for the state moving into summer and, and businesses like yours? Uh, massively. I mean, the amount of tourism um, that, that gets generated up here for, for Christmas and the summer period is, is, is massive. And it's, it's, it's a bread and butter for a lot of, a lot of restaurants and, and cafes and bars and hotels and whatnot. So to have people come over, um, you know, hopefully it's only a matter of time that Sydney people can kind of come up as well. But um, yeah, it's, it's only beneficial for everybody, especially um, moving people going from Byron Bay to Brisbane. Um, the dining scene is just explo- exploding at the moment. So there's so much, there's so much good quality restaurants um, that I think it, if, you know, having those borders open will definitely get us through this busy period and, uh, you know, hopefully keep us going for, 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 you know, the next winter, which is what people really rely on, um, you know, living up here. And um, yeah, I, I definitely feel that it's going to be a massive boost uh, to just, not only good for restaurants and bars and, and whatnot, but to just generate some money for the economy, uh, especially up here, it will, be, it will be huge, yeah, massively. A lot of our guests have talked about this period of time has been good to reflect on some of the issues and some of the opportunities. What's it been like for you personally? Is there some um, positives to come out of this time for you? Yeah, definitely. The, I think the positive, um, the positive, especially for Carla and I, on a personal level, um, yeah, for us, it's it's quite important that we we continue that work life balance. Um, you know, right at the start of COVID, uh, you know, we we were really trying hard for a family, and Carla had unfortunate miscarriage, and that was such a, a heavy blow for us. And you know, for us, really, it's it's just kind of trying to just keep as much positive as as possible. Um, it's just beneficial for everybody, for the staff, you know ourselves yeah it's just you know it's it's real positive just to keep going forward and just uh seeing what we get out of it you said a bit earlier that it might also give you space to do something else um empanadas are my weakness is that something that might be in your future (laughs) no (laughs) no unless mum wants a job but she's retired um no definitely definitely not um i'd unfortunately to say but um Look, you never never say never. I think there are there is a lot of potential growth up here, and um, yeah, for us, I think there is there is something on, on possibly on the works down the track, but it's a long way away. I mean, we're only two years into into Labard, and uh, I wouldn't say I want to get I don't don't want to get greedy too quickly. And um, you know, there there are some awesome businesses up here doing good things, and uh, it's we're just happy to be a part of it. But um, yeah, I mean, something else down the track would be nice, but um, we have so many ideas that we just don't know which one to actually pick and say, right, let's let's hone in on that and go for it. So, um, um, yeah, I, I think down the track there would definitely, you never know, empanadas selling, you know, asylum barbecues, but um, no, nah, there's definitely room for growth and um, definitely some things in the, in the, you know, in the woodworks for us to do. So fingers crossed. Fingers crossed that it all works out and we're heading that direction. Well, Alex, it's always good to catch up. We've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds. Keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>